This is Avon Silcock. Let's give him a warm welcome, shall we? <laughs> Avon's been around these parts for a while, and um, last night uh, I saw the, uh, the result of his uh, parenting by virtue of watching the rugby game on TV last night between the Crusaders and the Chiefs. And uh, at the end of the game, they were interviewing all the players and Avon's son was running around in the background waving the Chiefs flag. So <laughs> that must have been a, a wonderful parenting moment for you. Yeah, the Silcock family, uh, you're rewarded if you make it on TV. And um, we're, we're never going to be famous enough to get on by ourselves. So we just get behind that guy, <laughs> you know. Uh, so yeah, Quinn will pick up a reward for that. You might do. That's right. Well, <laughs> at least he wasn't the streaker. That's right. Yeah. Um, we, we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> Okay, Avon, um, you own an electrical business, you employ people, um, but what was it that made you see that being an employer rather than an employee was what God wanted for you? Um, so, yeah, I was, I was working as an employee for an electrical um, company. That I was working as a sales rep, that, um, and, that, and then the boss said, oh, we want you to work Saturdays from now on. And I thought to myself, no way. Um, did you have a young family at the time, or? Yeah, I had Tony was two and Jay was on his way. I think, and I yeah. thought, man, I'm, you know, for me, you know, it was if I can't make enough money in five days, something's wrong. So I, th I thought, no, nah, I'll try this for myself. So go out on your own. Yeah, so I went out on my own. I got um, Dell on board, and and she agreed, and um, we borrowed a little bit of money and yeah. had a crack on our own, which was cool. Been good. Cool. So as an employer, what sort of culture are you trying to build? How many guys do you employ, or ladies, guys and ladies? Around 15. 15 people? Yep. yep. So what's the culture there that you're trying to build? What would people talk about your, your firm? So, yeah, our culture comes from our values, which are people, lifestyle, and family. Um, and um, so with the people, you know, we we try and care for them individually. They're all different. And um, so I'd spend a bit of one-on-one -on -one with them and then sort of find out what they, their hopes and dreams and goals are, work with that. And then uh, the, we try and create a family lifestyle, a family environment where there's all that goes with that, with a bit of banter and a lot of fun and some yeah. some hard conversations sometimes. Sure. Um, so but you're, you're it, essentially mentoring these people one-on-one? Yeah, on one? yeah, pretty yeah. much, yeah. So yeah. in the lifestyle, we just try and make everyone's life fit within work as well as we can, be that okay. getting off to pick up, your, go to your first kid's day at school or a sports day or, yeah. or some people who, who want to – Pursue rugby careers. We we sure. work with that, and we've got someone playing for the Highlanders now who came through ABS Electrical. So very proud of that. But to get there is a lot of fitting within because of the trainings sure. and things like that. But yeah, so yeah. you're accommodating yeah. what their aspirations, what their, their goals, goals are. are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, big. yeah. Hey, um, so so what in what intentionally do you do within your business to see this culture come about? Because having this vision of a culture, but actually making it reality can be two different things. So. What are you intentional about? Yeah, so we're intentional with, um, like I say, creating a family environment. We'll, we'll have a, a meeting which is almost like a family meal time around a table. We don't eat a meal, but we, it's that sort of culture. Um, we have a lot of fun together, do experiences together um, to sort of bring bring the team together. Yep. Um, and we intentionally run a four-day week to fit with the, the lifestyle angle, um, mm. which allows people to, to have more time doing what they want in their lifestyle, be it spending time with family or volunteer or, or sporting stuff, yeah. So how does a four-day week work? How does it? Uh, so, yeah, we the, the business runs five days a week um, and half of us have Monday off, half have Friday off, and we so we cover the whole week. And, um, yeah, it works really well. People people are really happy with it. Some some people don't do it, so yeah. which is fine because that fits with their lifestyle. So, so they're doing 10-hour days? Yeah, four 10-hour days, so yeah. we're still doing 40 hours, yeah. Yeah. And working hard. I mean, the boys work really hard. Yeah, and, sure. and I say to them, look, you know, if you want to look after your people, look after your families and have a good lifestyle, you got to work hard. It yeah. doesn't just come, you know. So they, and they get that. And sure. they, they work really hard within that time so they can actually have the lifestyle. Yeah. So um, what do you think it is about yourself as a boss um, 
that allows your business to go the distance and, you know, what is it about you that's unique? Um, You're allowed to be proud. You're allowed to say confident things. Yeah, this is confident. Eh? My ability to make people think I know what I'm doing when I actually don't, that's, <laughs> that's my gift from God. Um, however, he, he has gifted me with the ability to, to, to relate to people, talk to people, and, and gather people who are way more clever than me uh, who actually run the business and I just hover, you know, and, and don't do much. Can, well, that's what my people say. They wonder what I do. <laughs> So I say a lot of my stuff is intangible. They, 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 so you must be a team builder. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you find the best in people. Yeah, I, li- I like to find the best in people. Everyone, yeah. everyone's different, and it's like yeah, trying to find their sweet spot and then put them in their sweet spot. Cool. Um, and and yeah, with a four day week, it's even better because you you can um, accommodate people who who don't um, fit so well together, and you can kind of okay. work that. Yeah. That's cool. It's a good experience for them. So um, what do you put in place then to create a good work-life balance? Because I know you've got some of your family also working for you. Um, yeah, I got some good advice once, which was when you, when you um, start a business, you create a monster. And um, That was good advice. Yeah, yeah the, the good advice was you need to keep that monster whipped oh and, and in its place because yeah. if you don't, it will – consume you sure so i you know so put rules in place you know you don't yeah. answer the phone after five or before seven um you make sure you you stick to your the, the values why you started you don't work saturdays you know you um you stick keep going back to the values that you thought about when you yeah. is the why you started and that keeps that monster in its place sure yeah or else it will consume you well yeah. i mean nature of being self-employed is you can let it become 24 7 um without any problems at all eh? Yeah, and, and you have to make some tough calls, you know, like um, people ring up and say, hey, um, can you do this job? And go, no, I'm too busy. But then they'll see you um, maybe down at the school watching your kids play sport. And they say, oh, I thought you said you were too busy to, my, to do my job. And I said, well, I, I am. I'm down at sport. You know, I'm not yeah. – uh, this is what we choose to do, you know. So too busy doing it's having those rules in place, which some people struggle to get, but you've got to stick to it, you know, if you yeah. want to do it. yeah. That little old lady didn't mind that her water heater wouldn't get touched, I suppose, yeah. No, we do do water heaters. and so, like, But, yeah, so you can still accommodate it through. Yeah. So where does Jesus fit into all of this? Uh, he pretty much fits in every day, and he's, he's, he's been there from the start. And, and you know, I, I ask myself, I, I'm living proof that there is a God because there's no way this business could operate um, with, yeah. without him. And he's there every day. And, you know, it's fantastic because... Um, it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity to live out your faith um, where everyone sees you at your best and your worst. Mm. Um, but he provides; he's been amazing with provision and and stuff like that. So the right yeah. people, the right people, just turning up. I've never ever advertised for staff, and and the people I've got are just fantastic. Hey, you know, yeah. you know, I've got a you know a lot of non Christian businessmen friends, and um, one guy said to me, "How do you get all your staff? You, you always get good staff." And I said, "Well, I pray." And he goes. How do you get all your good staff? You know, like. Um, so, so yeah, hey, Jesus is definitely there. Yeah. <laughs> well, mate, I know your reputation as an employer is uh, is really high. You know, people value working for you and Dell, and uh, and we just see that. You know, the fact that your your boys want to end up working for you is a pretty big story as well in itself. Um, so yeah, thanks for what you're doing. Appreciate who you are, and uh, let's give Avon a, and Dell a warm <laughs> um, appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this morning we begin a new series looking at this art of leadership. And I use that word specifically because leadership is an art. It's not a science, it's an art. And as much as people lead in different ways through different gifts, and therefore when I talk to an audience such as yourself, each one of you will have the gift of leadership in some capacity, whether it's being outworked in a very overt way or a a more subtle way in your own families or just simply leading yourself. And so when we talk about leadership today, we're talking about all of us here. Every one of us is a leader because every one of us has influence. I know when I go down to Countdown at times and uh, you know, I've got that shopping list and I see some of our staff 
sorry, some of our folks from our church working there behind the counters at Countdown, and I see the way in which they treat the customers. I see the way in which they embrace them and help them to discover what it is they need to find, particularly people like me. I never know where to find certain things. And um, so wherever you might be, whenever you're in a, in a position where you're with someone else, you're in a position of potential leadership. You're able to influence them. Leadership today is what... Um, is the, is the greatest challenge of our time, I believe. Around the world, we're seeing different forms of leadership that represent different values, maybe different political leanings. But when we look at the world around us, we go, wow, don't we need good leadership like never before? The world is so connected and people are so influenced by one another that unless there is a real positive demonstration of leadership, it's very easy for not only cities but for nations to lose their way. And so this morning, I'm going to go back to Noah, uh, we're going to read something of his story and get an idea of what his gift was and how he actually has left for us some whispers of wisdom that allow us to see what it is that he did in those very, with those very simple instructions to build a boat. But over the next 10 weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to find that leadership uh, complexity increases through the journey of Scripture. The difference between, say, Adam and Eve, who were asked to simply walk and talk with God, and that was their sole responsibility, through to the complexity of St. Paul, where there was doctrine, there were churches, there was persecution, uh, relationship problems. You see the complexity in a St. Paul compared to Adam and Eve is vastly different. So when we look at Noah this morning, we see someone who has been given a task, but it's a relatively simple task, and yet for most of us, um, we were going we to learn some lessons or rediscover some truths this morning about what leadership is about. This morning, I expect you to nod and agree with everything that I talk about, simply because, not because I'm right, but because the things that I'm going to talk about today are basic foundational leadership truths. Okay, and we need to start there. Because without starting there, you end up building on a false premise or you end up building something that's going to fall over. When I was first a Christian, I remember someone talking to me about leadership, and they described leadership as being a column like in a, um, a big Corinthian uh, temple or church, as we'd see it now. And they said that the, the beautiful thing about these columns is that they're so straight and true, and they hold up an enormous amount of weight. The weakness of these columns is this, is that if there is one seed, like a grass seed, found underneath that column where it's placed on the ground, and if that seed germinates, just that one seed alone will send a crack up through the column and cause it to break. And so when we look at these basic principles this morning of leadership, um, we've got to remind ourselves that there has been many, many occasions throughout history and even in the church where the one seed of something that's unreconciled in your life, some hidden sin or maybe some bad attitude, that hasn't been reconciled, becomes the very thing by which that will crack whatever responsibility that you've been given. And we could all probably find in our own memory half a dozen stories or pictures of people who have not allowed that seed to be swept away and cleaned away and have caused the downfall of the responsibilities and the ministries that they've been involved with. So I want to start this morning by talking about Noah. And I'm just going to introduce to you as he's introduced to us. From, uh, from Genesis chapter 6, and it says this. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Now, this looks like a very simple introduction, but I think there's something in here that we need to really see. Firstly, it talks about Noah being a righteous man, and then at the end of there it says he walked faithfully with God. So righteousness and faithfulness go together. they hand in hand. They reproduce each other. But there's an echo in there of him walking with God that comes to us from the Garden of Eden. You know, that very first call that Adam and Eve were given as their responsibility to walk and talk with God, to have companionship, fellowship with God. And so Noah was clearly one of these people who enjoyed fellowship with God. But what you notice in the middle of this uh, description of Noah is this. It said that he was blameless among the people of his time. And this is a really telling statement because People of different generations of different times had different values. And sometimes when we read scripture, we go, oh, here's a godly guy who's doing this. And he did what? David, he had a heap of wives. 
What's all that about? That doesn't seem right, you know? And so when we look at somebody, we need to also understand the context and the time in which they live because we won't find in Scripture a perfect description of what it means to be a leader in the 21st century today. What we do is we find somebody, as the Scripture says there, who was blameless among the people of his time. Now, our historical view of leadership is under attack in ways that it's never been before because we've got this thing that's emerged in recent years called cancel culture. It's where people look back at history and they see people who were celebrated uh, by the nations and uh, maybe statues were raised to them as, as a memorial or as a celebration of their lives. And we look back through the lens of our 21st century eyes and we see someone and we go, well, they might have been a great person in the day, but man, they made some big mistakes as well and we don't like that. And so people are pulling statues down. I mean, I think, I think personally it's the height of arrogance because you're starting from a position of saying, well, I've got it all together, I'm perfect. Therefore, I have the right to pull somebody's statue down. I mean, there are times when we've got to stop and look and say, hey, listen, that, that guy did bad things, you know, and maybe there's justification for pulling something down in good process. But we have to be very careful when we go back and we judge somebody else's actions through today's lenses. You notice what the scripture says? It says that he was blameless among the people of his time. I remember looking, well, I know I do these days, look through photographs of uh, my own family going back a few generations and they're smoking pipes and cigarettes and you go, man, they must have been stupid, you know? Well, they weren't really. They were just a product of their time, okay? We wouldn't think that uh, smoking cigarettes these days is a very bright thing to do for obvious reasons. But we look at it and we go, you know, in the day, that was an acceptable thing to do. In fact, my dad talks about how it was that... um, his dad taught his mum to smoke cigarettes because she, he felt that she needed the rest and relaxation that, that provided. And so my dad can remember his dad talking to his mum about, this is how you smoke a cigarette, dear. Well, different time, different generation. But does this make sense? Can you see what it is here? If we look at Noah and if we follow Noah's story right through, we'll find there's some unusual things that he got up to. But he was blameless in his day, in the period of time in which he lived. So let's have a look at what was really critical about Noah's identity. And Noah's identity was wrapped up in his family. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. Very specific, isn't it? God didn't say to Noah, hey, listen, I want you to get a few of your best buddies together and build me an ark. He says, no, no, it's your family that I'm interested in. I'm creating a covenant with your family. And because of Noah being a righteous guy, there was an impact upon his family. And we see how this works because families are always influenced generationally. And we'll come back and look at that in a few more minutes. But families are complicated, aren't they? Always complicated. Einstein uh, gave us this wonderful theory called the theory of relativity. But I think he would have done us more favors if he'd done the theory of relatives rather than the theory of relativity. Because we know, we know that um, relatives and family are more complicated than the theory of relativity, all right? Um, the interesting thing about Einstein is that whilst we look at him and say what a great scientist, he was a miserable husband and uh, a miserable father. Uh, he conducted himself into many affairs and, uh, and probably saw that as being a right of privilege. And this is what happens when people get above and beyond their own station in life where they think that they're entitled to things that aren't, that aren't legitimate. We've just seen Harvey Weinstein thrown in jail for just that. And so privilege and responsibility go together. And we learn all these things in the context of our family. Now, I know families are different right across the world, okay? And uh, a family is, can, cannot be defined. In fact, in 1999, the United Nations decided to have the International Year of the Family which meant that they spent the whole year arguing about trying to define what a family was. And ultimately, a person said, well, I'm on my own, and I'm the only one here, and I want to see myself as a family. So 1999 became the International Year of Everybody. So a family's hard to define, okay? But it's such an important place to be because we're all born of one mother, and ideally, ideally our fathers are there as well. And so we begin this family, and there we learn... We learn that we are loved, 
and we learn through the experience of our family what it is that becomes tradition, how character is formed, and very, very important basics like this. This last two weeks, um, Makata and I have had uh, our daughter and son-in-law and their two boys who are nearly three and just turn one. And so we've been relearning what parenting is all about and are very grateful to be grandparents, not parents again. Um, but we see in our kids how they are imparting to their kids the same values that we gave to our own children. That's how it works, isn't it? Intergenerationally, we, we pass on the things that are important to us and we allow ourselves to be shaped by those and then we end up raising, disciplining our children and their children do the same, passing on from one generation to the next. You see, family life is a training ground for leadership attitudes. And um, it's these attitudes that are really, really important to us. Because everything that we do in life is defined by attitude. Okay, We can do something. You can be uh, an electrician working for a firm or employing people, but it's the attitude of being the employer, the attitude of being, being the employee, which should define as to whether you are somebody people enjoy working with and you'll be a person of influence or somebody who's just simply tolerated because they can do their job but no one really likes you anyway. That's what happens. That's what happens. So attitudes are really, really important. And the family is a place where attitudes should be called out. Attitudes need to be acknowledged. And that doesn't mean just parents calling out attitudes for children, but equally it works both ways. A parent should be open to what it is that they need to be corrected about as well. Otherwise we just end up um, passing on from one generation to the next all of these bad habits. In, uh, in the uh, 19th century in America, there was a, uh, a revival preacher, a revivalist preacher by the name of Jonathan Edwards, uh, who did fantastic work throughout America. These huge outdoor campaigns and thousands of people came to Christ. And of course, he was a, he was a wonderful man, a godly man who lasted the test of time and all the challenges that came with being a successful preacher in his day. Uh, around about 180 years after his death, after, sorry, after his birth, some uh, sociologists got together and decided to work out what sort of legacy Jonathan Edwards had left through his children. And uh, this, is, this is the list. This was written about 20 years ago. Jonathan Edwards' legacy, and of course there's, there's Mrs. Edwards as well, let's not forget her, includes one U.S. vice president, a dean of a law school, a dean of a medical school, uh, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, 100 clergymen, and 285 college graduates. Well, that is called a legacy. A legacy built upon, firstly, faith in God, and secondly, the character that flows out of that faith and what it means for people to uh, pass on uh, success, be goal-oriented, and to look challenges in the eye and achieve. And this is what we see when families work well together. They pass on uh, positive things. But your own family might not have um, a great tradition, but that doesn't mean that you have to reproduce what it is that your family passed on to you. Because every person who has a relationship with Christ uh, has the opportunity to be completely transformed and to grow into the knowledge of Christ. Because in all of what we're talking about here with leadership this morning, Jesus is our greatest model of leadership. Okay, That's what the end goal is. And so when we look at somebody like Jonathan Edwards, we find ourselves looking in the past, but looking at the future as well, because even this list that's in front of us now is going to grow past us, and more people are going to come as a result of the legacy that he and Mrs. Edwards left. So let's get back to uh, let's get back to Noah, and um, get a get a feel for what it is that uh, that he had to do. Scripture tells us he said God told Noah, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be three hundred cubits long, fifty cubits wide, and thirty cubits high. 
Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a, a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. So we look at this picture and we realize that what God was wanting them to do was to build something specific. It wasn't just go, go build me a boat because without specific directions, people would have made it, probably made it small, too small for the purpose. Okay. And so God is giving people lessons here in accuracy. And when it comes to leadership, it's really, really important that we think of leadership as accuracy. We're looking to achieve specific outcomes. Now, when we're growing as leaders, that means that we have to have lifestyles that reflect a goal, reflect something that we're aiming at, have a level of accuracy about what we're wanting to achieve. We, we don't have the luxury of just wobbling our way through life and then at the end sticking a bullseye around where we've ended up. Okay, that's not what we're called to do. But to live with accuracy is a really, really important thing to do. I know that um, many of you over the years here have studied and uh, achieved things and study, maybe vocational training, on-the-job training, you've been doing that. Some of you would have done apprenticeships. Others would have gone into some mentorship program, maybe in retail or uh, orchard work or uh, all these different trades that we can buy into. The gift that you are given in respect to the career that you pursue, um, that is your first calling in respect to the adult world to be a leader. Because to be respected and to be known as somebody who works hard is a real, real gift to the person who you're working alongside. And it's something that has to be learned again and again and again. I know, um, I know in my own life... Um, working on my parents' orchard. 51 years ago, they bought a piece of land in Tapuna. They planted these little hairy things called Chinese gooseberries in the day. And uh, my folks were in the first dozen growers in the area to get into it. Um, and so my brother and I in particular, the, the responsibilities that we had around the orchard seemed to grow with our ability and our capacity. So when we were about eight or nine years old, I can remember every Saturday morning after rugby, after I'd been out playing rugby in the frost with no shoes. Oh. <laughs> We'd have to go and pick up fee jars. We had a, uh, a boundary of fee jars on, the, on the, uh, the boundary of the property, about 250 metres long. There was always fee jars under it. And I was just out there two days ago grabbing some fee jars under the same trees that my little brother and I used to have to go and get them. And so that was our, part of our learning. In the summer, my folks had a... Um, they had hothouse tomatoes, and it was a hot house. So 40 degrees, we're in there picking, but my folks always rewarded us with an afternoon at the beach if we got everything off to market in time. You know, that was great. And with the kiwi fruit, by the time we were uh, year, year 11, fifth form, um, we were managing the picking gangs that were picking the fruit, you know, driving the tractors, organizing the teams, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things we would learn, and the discipline of that, and the privilege of being able to work and the privilege of being able to lead was something that we experienced as young people. But we learned to do it with accuracy, and that gave us the ability to move on from there into other things, but take with us a sense of, um, firstly, identity, and secondly, um, just a culture that hard work had its own rewards, okay, in itself. Now, when you see somebody who knows what they're doing, they win respect, don't they? It doesn't matter what you do, but if somebody does something intentionally and is intentionally doing it well, you are develop, you've developed within yourself a character which becomes something that is attractive to other people. Now, I remember um, some years ago being down the South Island on a hunting trip, and uh, we were invited. We had this little boat on Lake Makiro, which is on the Holyford track. We had this uh, little boat that we had got the use of and we got invited by some folks who live on the lake. We were just camping in a tent. They live on the lake. Uh, they said, if you bring the venison, we'll cook it for you in our oven. It was like, great deal. So we got on this little boat and we ran around. They cooked the venison for us, had a lovely meal. We went back on, back on the boat to the camp. But in the middle of the lake, the boat broke down. So here we were, pitch black, boat broken down. And um, I'm like, what do we do now? But one of the guys on the boat, Noel, who, who, who's now a good friend, I didn't know him that well at the time, uh, he just whipped the cover off the boat and I said to my other mate, I said, are we, are we okay here? He goes, just watch, just watch. 
So uh, within about five minutes, he'd stripped down the carburetor, got the water out of the carburetor. All the time, the boat's going like this, and put it back together, vroom, and that beautiful sound of the engine starting again. Well, that was great, but on the way to meet the plane that was picking us up on this bush airstrip, about a week later, we had a boat full of stuff, and uh, we were heading up the river against the tide, and uh, had that horrible sound when the motor goes, ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba, stops. We pick up the fuel tank, shake it, and uh, she was all well, it was empty for all intents and purposes. So with that, Noel pulls out his knife, and I thought, hello, sacrifices, you know, to <laughs> lighten the load. And he just grabs the he just grabs the uh, the tube that goes into the petrol tank. He just chopped it off, opened the tank, stuck it in, and in the very corner of that tank, there was about half a cup full of petrol left. And we had just enough. He squeezed it through just enough. You remember that, Dave, when you're out fishing in your boat? And you just chop that off and you'll get home. Okay, we made it. Made it got. So, so what I'm saying here is that people who know what they're doing win respect. People who work with accuracy and intentionality know what they're doing. Um, another story that um, I think is important is, is um, just understanding that level of commitment and what it takes to actually be a leader who has the moral integrity to lead. And that all starts when you learn and, and earn your way into the workforce. One of the things that I was always big on with my kids, and Makata and I were, um, we would say to them, listen, the most important time of the day when you're working for somebody is 10 minutes to 8 and 10 minutes past 5. If you're working 8 to 5, I said, don't go ripping in there at 5 minutes past 8 throwing your lunch in somewhere, great, making yourself a coffee, and then sit down and finally get on to work at 20 past eight. You're paid to work from eight o'clock, so get there early, get ready to go. So uh, our daughter Melissa was working over at the Mount for a big firm one day, uh, for, for a couple of years, and um, one day she sort of woke up to the fact that everybody in her, her department left work at four o'clock on the Friday. It was just a culture. Maybe they'd done some extra work, I'm not sure. But she was, um, she was raised in our home. <laughs> so therefore, she would wait until after 5 o'clock and she would go, even on a Friday. Well, she said to us, or she confessed to us, that one day she was sitting there thinking, how come I have to do all the work and everybody else has gone home? So about 4.30, she gets in her car and she drives down the road, feeling okay about it. Then she gets to the roundabout and she had an attack of conscience. Dad was speaking to her. And she does a complete 180 on the roundabout, comes back, to work, comes back into her desk, and five minutes later, the boss walks in and says, where is everybody? And she goes, oh, they've all gone home. She goes, he goes why are you still here? Well, I'm paid to work till five, aren't I? And, and so, of course, she gets the pat on the back. But you see, the little things like that make all the difference when it comes to our integrity and our ability to work with accuracy. You imagine if one of Noah's sons had decided in his mind that every time he was out of the way, he would slack off. And so his job was to put the pitch, the tar, on the boat. Imagine if in one part of the boat he decided to have a few lazy days and uh, hadn't done that. Well, that would have caught up with them when they least needed that to happen, right? That's the way it would have been. I can remember working in the UK myself, uh, working on this. It was one of those jobs you get when you're doing your OE. It was working on this holiday camp. And uh, I was a groundsman. I had to do all these different jobs, and I worked with three other groundsmen. It was a big, big village. And uh, one day I was walking past this, uh, this concrete wall. I hear this voice. It says, Craig, Craig, where's that coming from? Craig, come over here. So I go around the back of this concrete wall. And there's this guy, probably 30 years older than me at the time, maybe my age now. And he says, come in here, bro, come in here. He says, do you smoke cigarettes? Oh, have a cigarette. I said, why? And he says, because you've got to slow down, mate. You've got to slow down. I said, what do you mean? She says, oh, you're making the rest of us look bad. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean, look bad? He says, you're working too hard. I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, young guy caught in this tension, but anyway, um, I just had to make them look bad, didn't I? You know, because you can't, you can't change who you are fundamentally. You know, and if you've learned that work is an important thing, you do it. So, let's push on. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. Now, the reason I put that up there is because he was 500 years old 
when he got given the task of building the boat. Now, commentators suggest that he probably took about 75 years to build the boat because they're assuming that his children were young and so they got married, etc., and had kids. And so 75 years to build a boat. Now, firstly, the first thing I've got to say to you, if any of you are um, under the age of 500, then God isn't finished with you, okay? <laughs> so you got that right? 500. You've still got jobs to do. Okay, um, but what I want to say here is that when you've been given a task by God and you know it's a task that he wants you to complete, then you've got to stand your ground while going the distance. You've got to go the distance. There's a lot of people just dib in and dib out, check in and check out. But you've got to go the distance. And then you've got to stand. You, there is no doubt in my mind, even though it's not mentioned in the story, there's no doubt in my mind that Noah and his family would have been given a hard time about that boat. Why are you building the boat? Well, God said the flood's going to come and uh, this is our only way to be saved. Oh, yeah, right, whatever. What an idiot, you know. Look at old Noah over there building that boat, you know. Come on, Noah, let's just get on with party life. Noah knew what God wanted of him and he would have had to stick to his guns and it became the family business to build the boat. Noah was passing on from one generation to the next what obedience to God looked like and ultimately, of course, it ripped its own, ripped its own reward. The whole family was saved. The thing I want to put to you now as we get towards the end of this talk is that um, metaphorically speaking, God wants us to build our own ark. God wants us to build a place where you become a safe person. And as a leader, the first thing that you've got to become is a, is a safe person. And so that comes back to having personal integrity. Personal integrity means that your yes is your yes, your no is your no. And that gives you the ability to be able to stand and people can have confidence that your character is the same yesterday, today, and into the future. Where somebody can say, I can rely on you and look to you for an answer or for some help or for leadership. That is so vital. And in, in a world today where everything's about the way you look rather than the character that you have, then you set yourself apart by being somebody who's trustworthy. You know, when we look at Jesus as being the ultimate model, we can say ultimately Jesus was trustworthy. But we look here at Noah, he was trustworthy too because he was given a task that meant that he had to stand, go the distance, hang in there when times got tough, hang in there when he was being persecuted, and have personal integrity towards the challenges that he was given. Now, for all of us, we have different challenges that will come our way. Some because they're situational, some because they're character flaws that we have to work through, but every one of us has been given a chance to deal with these. Your, your, um, the choices that you make in your life are your responsibility, and you need to be able to do those with as much wisdom as possible. Now, let me give you one little bit of advice about personal integrity and the person you're becoming. All you have to do is check out the people who you're hanging out with. Check out the people you're hanging out with. One of the toughest things I ever have to say to, a, to parents of, of teenage kids who the teenage kids are giving them a hard time, I say, do you know who your kids are? Oh, yeah, yeah, we know who our kids are. Our kids are this, this, and this. And I say, tell me about your children's friends. Oh, well, my friends, like the kids' friends, well, they're this, this, and this. And I say, I think you're probably reading your children wrong because your children are being influenced one way or another. That peer group is a peer group because... They have same character traits. They have the same values. So it's sometimes easier to determine where your children are at by the company that they keep. So the reverse is true also. You will be able to determine your own destiny by the company that you keep. Does that make sense? Now, you can't pick your family, all right? <laughs> okay, go and bless your mum today, but you can't pick your family. The thing is that you have been given a choice about who you are becoming. And God holds us responsible for the people that we are becoming. So be a safe person. Between you and God, let there be um, no dishonesty, no duplicity. The second thing is, um, are you a safe person one-on-one -on -one in, in your relationships? Are you somebody who can be trusted, somebody who can be leant upon, somebody who can be called upon? Because without that, you're unreliable or inconsistent. 
And thirdly, in your workplace or if you're in, in social environment, um, are you a safe person there as well? Can you be trusted to carry the plan forward? Can you be trusted when people confide in you? Or does their secret make it onto your Facebook page or Instagram account? You see, being a person who can be trusted is the 101, the basic of what it means to be a leader, to be consistent, to have integrity towards God, to be someone who is a safe place. That is what God wants. And so ultimately, what Noah produced with his sons was an ark that was safe, and it became a safe place for those animals to come and to be saved. And we ourselves are called to be an ark in a time of wild water, in a time when other things are not so consistent, when other people can't be relied upon as much as they used to be because they're more interested in things that are outside of God's will. You are the safe person. And somebody will call you boring. Somebody will call you religious. Somebody will try to define your your character for you. But you know who you are. And just as... Noah would have had some people talking him down. He knew ultimately what he was called to. And so I leave you this image that we've looked at before, an image of these pillars from the colonnade. You see, the more of these pillars that we can have together, solid, without any seed underneath them that's going to cause it to crack, the stronger the building becomes. And we know that as a church, what God wants from us is to be people who are able to support the responsibilities that we're given. Firstly, in the church, in our families, and then secondly, in society as a whole. As we have um, we see throughout our, our church life and people in it, there are people who have been given enormous amounts of responsibility. Enormous amounts of responsibility, not just with a corporate responsibility, but even enormous amounts of responsibility with, with resources, or numbers of children, uh, just the ability to be able to be a person of integrity within our society today is the very, very start of your leadership calling. So with that in mind, we're going to push on over the next few weeks. We're going to push on from this understanding of what the foundation looks like, and we're going to press into more of what it is that Christ wants for us. So let's stand, and I'll pray for us, and we'll um, have the team come and lead us in a final song. Father, we thank you that as we look at Noah, we see this this picture of a simple leader who's tasked with something that is a one vision opportunity to build a boat. And that meant for him, he created for his family and for future generations, a place of safety. For us, Lord, we want to be able to do the same thing. We want to be people who can be trusted. We want to be able to have that personal integrity that is seen through our families and through our community that we serve. So, Lord, help us to sweep clean, sweep clean the seeds of sin, the seeds that would cause the pillars to crack, be it now or in 10 years' time. Bring into the light the things that are hidden so that we won't be tripped up by them in the future. Lord, we ask this so that we can glorify you, for that is our greatest goal. So, Lord, I just want to pray that in the weeks ahead, that as we explore leadership in a greater way, we would see ourselves reflected in the mirror of Scripture. We would hear the whispers of wisdom coming through these ancient words and these ancient stories to enliven us in the 21st century with what you'd have for us to be and to, and to do. And so we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.